with hearts open to learn what you have for us today. Father, I thank you for every person, for every student that is now opening their Bible, opening their heart to receive truth from you concerning redemption. Father, we honor you as our Redeemer, and we walk before you as redeemed women and men of God. Lord, we want to learn all that redemption includes for our lives so that we can walk in it in the fullest, so that we can share these mighty truths with people in our world. This is the message we believe you want shared with the world, and that's why we are here, Lord, to learn, so that we can reflect you in a true way in our witness, in our ministry, in our lives. In Jesus' name, may your spirit rest on every person. May your anointing rest on me as I teach and everyone as they learn. May your anointing be present to reveal truth. In the name of Jesus, we receive from you by faith. Everyone say amen. amen. God bless you. This lesson today is titled, See Yourself as God designed you. You remember last week we began this course and we looked at, we began our look at redemption and we're in this course, we're taking redemption in a sequential manner. Now to me this is very exciting because as we, every time we stop and we review redemption in a sequence, we build within ourselves the idea that truth from God must have continuity. It helps us in our faith to get away from the idea that we believe this as an isolated, fragmented piece of truth, and then we believe this, and then we believe this, and we believe this. Oh, there are so many teachings about so many subjects. Some people are, really believe in prayer, some in faith, some in healing, some in gifts of the Spirit, some in tongues. And you can break it down so fine in a, in a minuscule way that people rarely stop and just think, Wait a minute, what do I believe and does everything that I believe hook up together to make a one beautiful picture of God's idea about me? Because all of our, all that our faith is, is our relationship with God, our trust in God, what we think about God, what we think He thinks about us, what he, we think He wants us to do with our lives. So all these have to do with our relationship with God and our relationship with other people. If what we believe individually does not line up collectively, we are open to very much frustration, fear. We're subject to all kinds of strange teaching. I believe that redemption is the foundation of everything we should accept in our lives as truth. I believe every time you read a scripture and something is quickened to you, and you believe that, oh, I've never seen it that way. This must be a, a revelation. This may be something the Holy Spirit is, is enlightening to me. You must always stop and say, how does this fresh insight measure up with the truth of redemption? Now, because I believe that so strongly, I enjoy teaching redemption in a sequential way where we just cannot get away from what we studied last week to this week to next week and keep measuring it against everything else that we've studied and learned. Now, that's what we're doing in this course, and it's, it's wonderful. Last week, we dealt with God designing you for a purpose. We didn't even get to the creation of the human family last week. We just, we previewed God's heart and God's objective in creation. And we saw that all that God did in creation was ultimately with people in mind. We saw that God created us to live on this earth, on this specific planet. That was his design from the beginning. His purpose was for us to live here in harmony and fellowship with him. You must never question that God had a purpose for you. This fact brings us to what we want to discuss today. God, we want to see ourselves as God designed us, as he created us. We're coming to the actual creation this week of the human race, the beginning of the human family. 
And let's see this creation and let's see the product of this creation from God's perspective. If we will lay this brick in the building of our knowledge of redemption, there are so many things, my dear friends, you will never have to deal with in a negative way in your life. When you see yourself as God designed you, as we go through this lesson, you just, you just stay open. Say, well, okay, that being the case, yes, I believe that. Yes, I'm sitting in this class. Yes, I'm taking notes. Yes, I'm ascribing to that truth. But allow the Holy Spirit to be charging you with insight. Okay, if that's true, then what does this have to do with this area of my life and this area of my life and this area? Make it apply to your life. See yourself as God designed you. First of all, God's plan is good. Fill in the outline as we go. This will help you in your study. God's plan is good. You see, after creation... God had been speaking things into existence. He had been creating by the power of his word. After all of the heavens and the earth were created, and all of the animals and the plants, all the the ambiance into which he would introduce his human creation. We read in Genesis 1, verse 25, that God saw that all was good. This, to me, is a very significant pattern in our study and our discovery of redemption. Mark it down as an absolute. Everything God does is good. Hmm. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. It takes so much pressure off when we don't have to vote. If we know God did it, we know it's good. In this first chapter of Genesis, first thing you see is God created the light. He saw the light and he saw it was good. That's verse 4. Verse 10, God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Verse 12, the earth brought forth forth grass and herb that yields seed according to its kind and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind, and God saw it was good. Everything as God created it, he saw and he assessed it as good. Look at verse 18. Did I say 16? I hate to skip 16. He made two great lights and then go on to 18, one to rule the day, one to rule the night, to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was what? Good, absolutely. So the sun, the moon, the day, and the night. Then in verse 21, we see whales and all other creatures in the ocean and the winged creatures. He created great sea creatures, every living thing that moves, every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was what? It was good. Amen. Verse 31. Well, let's look at 35. God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, everything that creeps according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Yes. Verse 31. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. It was good because it all was coming from the hand of the Creator. And God is good. He cannot create anything that is other than good. Do you believe that? Do you remember the story of the astronomer? He was a French astronomer, very famous, but he was not a believer. He was an atheist. And he stood in a great conference and he said, I have sweeped the skies with my telescope and I have never found God. Thought that was a point in his, in, on his side? <laughs> Fine. But a man stood up who was a musician. He says, let me just tell you something else. I think that is similar to saying I could take my violin and I could take it apart piece by piece and I could put each element under the magnification of a telescope and I could say I have taken every piece apart and I have examined it thoroughly and I have never found music. Good parallel. Absolutely. You see, we see God in creation 
Therefore, everything that we see in creation is good. God declared it so. Secondly, first of all, all that God, his plan is good. Secondly, people are the crown of God's creation. Now, this is wonderfully esteem building. When you look from our lesson last week at all of the universe, all of the galaxies that God created, and all was his energy at work focusing on the human creation. Well, that makes you feel pretty good when you accept that and you remember it. Then you come to his minute creation, fixing this very planet, putting everything in place, all of the life, all of the beauty, all of the variety, all of the things that are part of the pleasure of our lives. And then we see that after all of this, God created people. You and me, the beginning of our human family. And according to the scripture, we are the crown of his creation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. What an idea. Can you imagine the inventiveness of God? Can you imagine if you were an inventor and you worked and you worked and you worked and you finally came up with something so unique and so special? Think about one species of bird. What if you could create a one tiny little bird, maybe without beautiful feathers, not the colors, just a plain little brown bird? that could hop and eat and chirp and fly and maybe even reproduce. Can you imagine? I, have, I brought back some placemats. They were given to me in Papua New Guinea. And each of the six placemats has a different species of the bird of paradise, the most gorgeous, elaborately ordained <laughs> birds I have ever seen. Imagine. If you could really create something like that, and then you sit back and you say, oh, let me just reproduce myself and give everything I've created. Give it over to them. Let them have dominion. Let them rule. Let them enjoy. Let them be the boss of all my creation. What love. I'm talking about you being the crown of God's creation. This is an esteem-building lesson. Redemption, as we come on through the study of redemption, it doesn't mean near as much to you if you don't understand what God had in mind for you, what he thought about you, what he envisioned for you in the very beginning. This is the dream that we must guard in our hearts and hold dear and not let any circumstance, any negative voice, any sense of failure or inferiority ever take hold and squeeze out from us and stamp out the life of God's dream in us as it comes to you through study, through lessons like this. Allow the Holy Spirit to just lift you up to a new level of power and esteem and self-awareness and dignity and with God. That is the purpose. You are the crown of God's creation. I want to read you something from a commentary. It's a beautiful uh, Genesis commentary called the Bereshish. Commentary on this very scripture, Genesis 1, 26. Having completed all forms of creation... This is Bereshish, you that have a reference, page 67. Having completed all the forms of creation, God said to them, God said, let us make humankind. Like a person who builds a palace and after having furnished and decorated it, ushers in its owner so it's ready for their immediate dwelling. God said, and God said, and God said, See, this was a special utterance dedicated to the making of humankind in recognition of their superiority.
The quote, let us make man. This commentator says this preamble indicates that humankind was created with great deliberation and great wisdom. God did not associate our creation with the earth by decreeing let the earth bring forth as he did with other creatures but instead he attributed it to the deeper involvement of divine providence and wisdom the intent is let us bring to perfection and the as yet uncreated person whose image and form awesomely equip them to rule and govern Are you hearing me? This term man, a general term for mankind as a whole, applies to both male and female. You who have been students at LDBI, you know that. You've studied that. You have scriptural proof for that. Yes, I'm talking about people being the crowning glory of God's creation. I'm stressing this because there is so much in religion that has whittled you down told you you were bad that you were sinful that you were a worm in the dust and it steals from you the very purpose for which God created you you have to seed a lot of good stuff to out weed <laughs> the negative that's already been sown into you if you've been a believer for very long you know what I'm talking about you that are new believers and you come into this beautiful teaching of who you are what god intended when he created you oh take a breath of fresh air and never wonder what the other teaching is you don't need to know <laughs> this is a interesting copy comes out of the uh encyclopedia of judaica you who have that reference is volume 11 beginning page 843 i'm talking about the creation of human kind Human kind is not a descendant of the gods as in certain pagan mythologies nor are we the product of the blind forces of nature we are the artifact of god fashioned purposefully out of two diverse elements our body is of the earth and it's animated by the divine breath of life a living person We are the peak of creation formed by special resolve and in a unique manner made in the image and the likeness of God. We alone among the creatures are capable of sustained thought, creativity, awareness of God, and are privileged to commune with God and enjoy his fellowship. If that's not a five-point sermon on human dignity, I've never heard it. See yourself as God designed you. See yourself with this kind of dignity. See yourself with this kind of exclusivity in all of creation. People are created. A on your outline. People are created in God's class of being. Never question that you are special. You did not just happen created in the image and the likeness of God. something interesting. I'm not a biologist. Some of you who have studied that would understand more. But in in reading and studying, I discover something very exciting to me. All types of creation, and there are all kinds of life that are logged, they're cataloged, they're named. They each stay in their own class. There are class distinctions in all of the life demonstrations. It's impossible genetically according to the study that I've made. It's also impossible biologically for any form of life to cross over what's called its order line. All kinds of life are within an order. Every living organism has what is called a DNA chain, and you've been hearing more and more about that as as there's studies into genetics. But this DNA chain is a molecular structure that actually identifies what this thing is it has a, a unique dna chain that you can that dna chain equals what this is whatever name you want to put on it that's what it is there is what's called mutation where within an order there are changes created some artificially through dna manipulation 
However, even in that, the highest degree of what is going on in the scientific lab, still, there has not been any, in any form of the crossing of some living organism to another order, changing what its basic thing is. <laughs> A no order, or lower form of life has ever crossed over its order line into a higher form of life. Isn't that wonderful to know? Isn't it good news to look at your legs and know you never were a tadpole? God fashioned you, created your physical body for his image to dwell in. Oh, hallelujah. You are created in God's class of being. You just got to think of yourself in new and fresh ways that build you up so that you know what to do with your redeemed status as you understand it. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you hear what I'm saying? Yes, I know you do. Secondly, this is B on your outline. You were created with specific responsibilities. Or no, specific abilities. Specific built-in capacities. And we look at these. We're reading Genesis 1, 26. Let's go on, beginning at verse 27, and just read together three verses. So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you, it shall be for food. Now out of this, I have plucked six specific abilities or capacities that God has built into every person. And in my Bible, I have put a little number within the scripture to just remind me. And then out at the margin, I have written these singular words. Every time I read Genesis chapter 1, I'm reminded what God created in every person. Number one, equality. And I have a little number one. In verse 27, just before the word male, male and female, he created them and he blessed them. You see, we, we have to understand in, the, in, in, the, in, our, in dealing with a theology that has been passed down through the centuries, most contemporary theology is rooted in what we could call post-fall I said this last week. I want you to get this. Very little of our theology forces us to go back and build it on pre-fall truth. Yet that is the that is the discipline of understanding redemption. For example, most scriptures that are pulled out to tell women they are subordinate to men are scriptures based on Genesis chapter 3, after the fall. That was not God's idea. We have to, as we understand redemption, we have got to bring our sights back to God's creation plan. This is where the power of our redemption status is nourished from. Equality. God created male and female in his own image. That is equality. The personhood of every creation of God, every human person, is something precious to be preserved, to be groomed, to be connected with God, to have that fellowship with God, to live in harmony and peace with God independently and with people socially. Number two, ability. God created within each person true ability, 
inexhaustible ability. There is no limit on what a person can achieve. And you've heard, you've read some tremendous stories of the capacity of the human person mentally and physically and emotionally and spiritually. Oh, the dimensions that we can actually achieve. That's because God created it in us. I have a number two. By be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. This is a scripture that isn't just limited to our physical gifts of being able to reproduce. When you see that the human person has tremendous ability to reproduce in every way, this is a God characteristic, and I call it ability. We know that Adam was called on to name all of the animals. Now, this was quite a chore. Can you imagine? According to some documentation I've read, he named 500,000 different species of critters. What capacity? I don't know that I could think up 500,000 names if my life depended on it. Now, maybe I could. But this tells me that every person has an inexhaustible capacity to look, to perceive, to establish, to speak, to remember, to have purpose and reason in what they do. And then what we name lasts. When Adam named the animals, that's the name they carried. Ability. Number three, superiority. By the word subdue it. Subdue it. Listen, this is the kind of superiority I believe in. I don't believe people are ever to be superior one over another. (laughs) I believe in order. I believe in leadership. I believe in harmony. I believe in God's order of all things. But I do not believe any person has the right to dictate and usurp authority and require certain action out of another person. I don't believe it's right. I don't believe it's right in a marriage. I don't believe it's right in any kind of relationship. I believe if God preserves the individual identity of each person, who are we to decide we have in our power the right to dominate other people and require them to do something because we believe it's right. We have the power of influence. We have the power of seed. We have the power of our life example. We have the power of the truth of God's word that gives us the strength to prove what we believe in our own life. That's our greatest influence in our world, to take a stick and whack people and say, no, you have to. God didn't do that. If God didn't do it, we sure can't. I just believe that. I live my life according to that. And I've been in leadership a very long time, and I've never had a problem with that. I've never had a problem. Because there's, it puts a wonderful responsibility on leadership. When you strip yourself of that artificial, man-made, man-given, man-appointed, man-fostered kind of superiority. And it requires you to be true to God and walk in His leadership and live the kind of life that people want to follow as you follow Christ. That's the kind of leadership I believe in. Oh yeah, and it works. It's wonderful. God created us to be under rulers with Him. He created us to have superiority over all of the creation. Do you believe that? Say amen. Amen. Number four, he has given us authority. I have a little number four written before dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Authority. Turn over to Psalm, the eighth Psalm. This is a wonderful Psalm in line with what we're saying, beginning verse three. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, and the moon and the stars which you've ordained, what, and you'll see compared to your translation, I'm taking a little bit of liberty here, what are people 
that you're mindful of them. And the son, sons and daughters or the children of people that you visit them. You have made them a little lower than God. And you have crowned them with glory and honor. Verse 6, you have made them to have dominion over the works of your hands. And you've put all things under their feet. That was redemption insight that was pouring through this man. Oh, hallelujah. I'm talking about authority over the creation of God, not authority over each other. Have I made that sufficiently clear? Do you agree with that? Or do I need to make it a point to go into that deeper sometime? Just write me a note and tell me if you've got a hang up about that. I could pull out some wonderful stuff. You need to take Dr. Daisy's class, Creation Realities, for starters. Then you go to Old Testament Discoveries as follow-up. You've still got questions, you come to me. We want you to understand this in the truest sense where it will hold water with redemption. We believe redemption is the key that all has to measure up to. You see, if when women are redeemed by the power of the gospel, by what Jesus did on the cross, if he redeemed women in an inferior sense to what he redeemed men, there is something wrong with our theology. I have absol- I can't take time in this lesson, but you see, we're not talking about anything that is a clash in the home, in the ministry, in our lives, in our families. This truth creates such strength and harmony and faith and such a strong posture between husbands and wives, mothers and fathers. It works. It works. The other doesn't work. And if you wonder if that's true, look at the divorce rate. This is a product of that old teaching. It isn't working. The violence in the home, that's an epidemic, not just in this country, but around the world. This is an outgrowth of our theology that hasn't worked. It's time for us as believers to wake up and say, hey, what's the problem? Do we either have an answer for the world or we don't? If we have an answer, then it requires some courage and some self-analysis to stand up and say, Father, what's going on? Help me to be a voice that's a positive voice of change. And if your objective is to point people to Jesus Christ so that they can follow him as their Lord and Master and do the things he told each person to do, when that's the motivation, you don't have a problem. Let's keep studying. Number five, prosperity. I have a number five written before. Every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you, it shall be for food. God has built the desire and the accommodation for prosperity within this earth for you. He's built within you his plan for prosperity. First thing he said is creation. See, everything you see, it's yours. Have you ever had? No. We can't even imagine that. We're, 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 so, we're so archaic in our attitude about so many things because we've never been taught the pre-fall status of the human creation. I hope this comes clear to you today. To imagine, can you, can you imagine 10 years ago, when what's called the prosperity message start, started being voiced. Oh, what radical teaching that was. Because we were always taught that money was bad and that the more poor you were, the more humble you were, and the more humble you were, the more like Christ you were. I, I mean, really? We had to be... We, our holiness was really wrapped around our poverty. And if we would get money, we'd think we would sin and go off the deep end. And we were taught this. I know, none of you. I see those innocent eyes. But can you imagine being taken out in the middle of the world? Everything created, everything beautiful, and God just saying, see, everything you see, I've given it to you. Now, immediately, you don't have to have a hang-up about what you need. You don't have to wonder, oh, how many hours do I have to stay on my knees if I'm going to get my food today? Or protection. Or direction. See, we're, we're, we're so crazy. In what we're taught, we're still doing penance in our prayers in order to receive the things God created for us in the beginning. I'm talking redemption. This excites me. 
We were never created to be second class in any way. We were created to be on God's level, never created to be a slave, created to be a reflection of God in this world. He created you to be his partner. He created you to be with him in fellowship, in abundance, in superiority, in all these abilities, including prosperity. Now, number six, I call this free will because this in fact, is the most dynamic truth that stays with us every day of our lives. Nothing takes this from us. I have this number six at the beginning of verse 27, where it says, God created humankind in it before own image. Own image, I have number six. Because this is where we discover the free will that God created in every person. I want to read to you out of Bereshish. Page 70. After our likeness, with the power of understanding and intellect, humankind alone among the living creatures is endowed, like the Creator, with moral freedom and will. They're capable of knowing and loving God and of holding spiritual communion with Him. And humankind alone can guide his actions in, according with re, in accordance with reason. He's therefore said to have been made in the form and likeness of the Almighty. If all the com- compassion and love and truth and equity and holiness of the divine rule were to be represented in an exterior form, it would be embodied in the form which the Creator gave this man. Adam. This form proclaims him as God's representative, the divine on earth. Isn't that powerful? It's powerful. That bearish, I tell you, is so insightful into the creation of, of, of God, the, God's creation and his heart in creation. And let me read this concerning free will out of Encyclopedia Judaica, volume 11, page 844. There is still another aspect of the divine image reflected in people, which plays a crucial role. In a supreme act of self-limitation, the absolute God gave us freedom of moral choice. We could, will, we could will to do right or wrong, to obey or disobey our Maker. This was God's greatest gift to us. While the Bible is unequivocal in its assertion of the reality of human responsibility for evil and in condemning sin as estrangement from and treason against God, it is no less emphatic, listen to this, in its affirmation of God's grace and his readiness to forgive. Sin is never final. Retribution is part of the divine redemptive process. Say hallelujah. Oh, we're talking purpose here, that God never gave up on his original idea for you. You must see yourself as God designed you. You have the free will to see yourself that way. You also have the free will to not see yourself that way. Jesus said in Luke 9, chapter 23, If anyone desires to come, let them come after me. That invitation has never changed. It all rests on our desire. Do we want to? If we want to follow him, all we have to do is come. That's all. That is the only issue. That is the only issue. That is the only issue. We are hung up on so many things that are not the issue. We have to determine once and for all in our heart, do we want Jesus Christ as the number one in our lives? Do we believe in him completely? Do we give our lives over to him without any question, without any further discussion? We make that one-time commitment. Then it's a matter of walking and trusting and letting him prove his faithfulness in our lives. That's what he proves, is his faithfulness. It's not a test, is he or isn't he? He is. He absolutely is. 
Next, let's go to accepting your value. This is heading in your outline. Accept your value. We see that you, that all that God's plan was good. And then we see that people are the crown of his creation. That brings us to the important fact that you must accept your own value. Created in the image of God, you are his kind of being. You have to start seeing yourself that way. Do you remember the story of the birds? It's a fable concerning creation. And it says that all of the newly created birds were around with all of the other creation. And the birds were walking around and they were testing things to see what it felt like to be alive. And all the other animals were having a good time. They were walking and running and stretching and grinning and all the things that animals do. But the birds were having a problem. They were dragging around these things that were hanging from their bodies, that were a real nuisance. It was making it awkward to walk. And they were in the way. And they were complaining, why of all the creation did God put on us this burden of carrying these things around? Nobody else has them. But one of the birds was a little more adventuresome and started working with these things and started flopping them and stretching them. And before you know it, that little one was flying. So he soared around and he came back and he says, Oh no, you've got to understand what God created for us was special so that we could soar and observe all of his creation. You see, I believe we should see our free will that way, not as a burden, not as something that, oh, sometimes we just like to cover our heads and say, God, you make the decisions for me. I don't know. I'm scared. But you see, if we can exercise this built-in power that he's given us, learn how to work with it, oh, how it brings us to the level of God so that we see things from his perspective and our lives are the way God designed them. Do you see that? We are created in God's class of being. So your value as a person has nothing to do with your education, your success, your bank account, your influence, the failures in the past. Your value today has nothing to do with that. Your value has to do with you are created by God in His image. Nothing can steal that from you or change that fact. In the most difficult setting, you can stand tall and say, wait a minute. I'm made in the likeness, in the very image of God. Look out! Let's just see what God and me can accomplish together. It's not over yet. Have confidence in yourself. See yourself that way. Ephesians 2.10 says you are God's workmanship. You are God's workmanship. The bottom line of a good positive self-image, of self-esteem in your life, a God kind of attitude on you, is I accept the value God has placed on me. That's what you can say. That's not pompous. That's not proud. That's not out of order. That's submitting to God's idea about you. That's what we must do. When you see yourself the way God designed you, you are rid of jealousy. Why? Because you accept you. You no longer try to be someone else. You no longer aspire after copying someone else. You accept you. Secondly, when you accept yourself the way God designed you, you wipe out inferiority. Why? Because you know you're in God's class. How can you be inferior and be in God's class? Not possible. Thirdly, you will will eliminate the fear of failure. Why? Because you know you can do anything. You see, God's on your side. Nothing can stop you. Fourthly, you'll have courage. You will develop a deep sense of courage that you've never known in your life. Why? Because you trust God. Courage is rooted in trust in God. Not trust in self. Trust in God in you. And fifthly, you will stand tall. You will stand tall because you know you're part of God's plan. Walk in that knowledge. Sixth, you will look into the future with a new confidence. Because you see yourself 
the way God designed you. You see that you have a purpose. You look to the future different because when you trust God, you're not impatient about the future. You're not apprehensive about the future. You're not full of fear concerning the future. Are you hearing me? I'm talking about your value. Accept your value, the value that God has put on you. Jesus Christ came and he demonstrated for all time that people have value. Study his life and that is what you will see. He says to us in John chapter 14, The one who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. If anyone loves me, they'll keep my word and my Father will love them. We will come to them and make our home with them. I leave you today with just the challenge. See yourself as God designed you. Accept that as truth, as part of your redemption package, and walk in that confidence. Do the will of God as concerns you. He values you. Value yourself. And watch what will start happening in your lives. I challenge you in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we commit this lesson and your attitude toward people to the hearts of every student. May you by your spirit illuminate these truths and may we have the courage to apply them and remember them when negative voices come to say we have no value. May we remember your value and your design for us. In Jesus' name.